Just a couple of years ago, you would have thought that Apple had all but forgotten about its iPad Air line. However, since then, we've seen two new updates with the fourth generation, the 2020 model, which I have in my hands right now, having the biggest change we've seen to the iPad Air ever. I'm Jason Cipriani, a ZDNet mobile contributor, and today we're going to talk over the iPad Air. So for the 2020 model of Apple's iPad Air, they did a new design. As you can see, there's flat edges all around. It looks very similar to the iPad Pro lineup as well as the new newly announced iPhone 12. These flat edges are a lot like the iPhone 4 and iPhone 5 lines, and they bring back some of that nostalgic feel, but also some utility, and it makes it, for me at least, easier to hold. Now, you'll notice there isn't a home button on the front of this iPad Air. It has a 10.9 inch display with bezels all the way around, just like the iPad Pro does, but like I said, there's no home button, and it lacks Face ID like the iPad Pro line, so you can't sign in just using your face. However, Apple has done something kind of interesting and something we haven't seen them do on a mobile device thus far, and that is they moved the Touch ID sensor into the power button on top here. You can kind of see it. It's a little sliver there, a piece of glass, and all you have to do to unlock the iPad is rest your finger on it and press the button. If the iPad is already awake, you just rest, and a couple seconds later, it's unlocked. That's one of my top features on this. I didn't think I would get used to not using Face ID on the iPad, but after a couple hours of use, I was instinctively reaching for that Touch ID button and signing in or approving purchases without any issues. Another notable change Apple has made on the iPad Air is it did away with the lightning cable or the lightning port on the bottom and instead there is a USB-C port. This is also an iPad Pro-like feature that we first saw exist on those higher end devices but now it's made its way to the iPad Air which allows you to connect it to up to a 4K display. You can also connect uh, external hard drives, cameras and there's a 5 gigabit per second data transfer speed that you can use with the Files app or your Photos app to get pictures off or images off of a camera that you've connected to it. It's a very versatile feature and something that, frankly, all the iPads should have uh, all the way down to the base model without having to use some weird lightning connect connector and dongle. It, USB-C all the way. The iPad Air also works with Apple's second generation Pencil which attaches magnetically to the top, and that's how it charges, and the first time you connect it, it automatically pairs. It doesn't have the ProMotion display that the iPad Pro lineup does, so you don't get that real fine, minimal latency when you're drawing or writing on the screen. However, I don't draw or write all that much, but when I do, I don't really notice a difference in the experience between the iPad Air's display and the iPad Pro's display. Another iPad Pro feature, or accessory I should say, that's compatible with the Air is Apple's Magic Keyboard. This keyboard uses the smart connectors on the back of the iPad Air to dock itself and some magnets into the keyboard, which also has a trackpad on it, which as of iOS 13.4 last year was officially added, support for trackpad or mice were officially, was officially added to the iPad lineup. So you're able to use this just as you would a small portable laptop and take it with you on the go constantly. Now, I replaced this iPad Air, or I replaced my iPad Pro with this iPad Air for the last few days. And to be honest with you, I didn't notice a lick of difference. The A14 Bionic processor in here is faster, but as far as screen size goes and the overall experience, the iPad Air matched what my Pro can do or exceeded it. And now, my, my Pro is a couple years old, so it does have older hardware inside. However, the Air itself, even though the screen is 10.9 inches instead of 12.9 inches, I didn't feel cramped. I didn't feel like I was writing or working on a smaller display, probably because that home button and the chin that Apple had to allow and make room for, for that home button, was gone. The experience was actually quite pleasant. I was able to get quite a bit of work done. And by the end of you know the fourth or fifth day, I was getting used to a smaller footprint for the iPad Air overall. And I, I even took it to me, you took it with me and worked in my car. Uh, I, you know, it just was an overall more portable device than the larger iPad Pro. Overall, it's not a perfect tablet. It starts at $599, so it's not the most 
expensive, but it's also not the least expensive device in Apple's lineup. You know, the base iPad starts at $329, whereas the iPad Pro starts at $799 for the 11 inch model or $999 for the 12.9 inch model. Well, six, uh, $599 for the iPad Air gets you 64 gigabytes of storage, which frankly is not enough. It should start at 128 gigabytes in my opinion, and then go up from there. The Air is only available in 64 gigabytes or 256 gigabytes of storage for $749. So there's some leeway there as far as what you want for storage, but also you're gonna pay quite a bit if you have to bump up to that 256 gigabytes like I said, it would be great if it started at 128 and then you could double it for you know that $150 difference. By the time you add the Magic Keyboard, which is $299, or the Apple Pencil second generation, which is another $120, it gets to be an expensive product, but that's kind of par for the course with tablets across the board. Even Samsung's Galaxy Tab S7 line, those get up near $1,000, which is where you'll be if you fully kit this one out. However, the experience on an iPad with iPad OS and the app selection and the app quality and just the integration overall is far superior than anything you could find on an Android tablet. So I guess the last question is, who is the iPad Air for? You know, and I struggled with this question leading into my time testing the device as well as all throughout my review. And I think I finally came down to the conclusion it's for almost everyone. And by that, I mean, unless you're someone who is only going to use a tablet to uh, watch a couple shows, maybe play Scrabble or some low quality games, you know, not resource intensive games, then the base model iPad is gonna suit you just fine. However, if you plan on working from your iPad at all, whether it's triaging your inbox, working in Excel spreadsheets, writing Word documents, writing longer documents in a different application, or even Adobe Illustrator, it just launched yesterday for iPad overall. The iPad Air is not only the better deal, but it's just as capable or nearly just as capable as the iPad Pro. In fact, at the end of all of this, I've started to question instead of why does the iPad Air exist, why does the iPad Pro exist? It's the top of the line device and there are some benefits there with the fa faster display, uh, better speakers, and, and other subtleties. But realistically, the iPad Air, when kitted with a keyboard accessory and an Apple Pencil, can do the job just as well, based on my own experience, as an iPad Pro, and you're gonna save yourself a few hundred dollars. So for me, the iPad Air is the tablet to beat right now. Once again, I'm Jason Cipriani with ZDNet. Thank you for watching, and make sure to check out more of my work at ZDNet.com.